Ladies and gentlemen, coming soon, a podcast you've all been waiting for. The Movie Podcast to End All Movie Podcasts, a podcast that discusses and critiques the best of the best and the worst of the worst movies playing at a theater near you with a host whose opinions have been deemed as fact by your favorite fact checkers. And that's a fact. Without further ado, let me introduce you to the movie maestro, the tyrant of theater, the gumshoe of review, the man that makes theater employees and Hollywood execs shiver by his mere presence. Ladies and gentlemen, the judge, the jury, the sultan of cinema, Justin Hanson. Welcome to the Movie Wire. Welcome to this week's edition of The Movie Wire. I'm your host, Justin Henson, and welcome to the show. We can tell that Halloween is just around the corner because I have a lot of reviews for horror movies scheduled in the next couple of weeks. But for now, this week brings four brand new reviews with two new in theaters and two now available to stream. This week on the show... Two young girls disappear only to return possessed by a demon in The Exorcist Believer. A mysterious murder, a hardened detective, a truth more dangerous than they could have ever imagined in the Netflix original Reptile. Sometimes dead is better in the prequel to the Pet Cemetery movies. Now streaming on Paramount Plus is Pet Cemetery Bloodlines. And finally, let's take a break from horror and unleash your super paws in Paw Patrol, the mighty movie. Yes, I review all movies. We've got a big show to cover, so let's jump right into it. Ready for my verdict? Let's get into it. <laughs> Out of the windows to watch a roar and a burst of flames. The Movie Wire Podcast. Oh, there it is. We've just made paper like this. The Wire. And here we go. In 1969, a young Judd Crandall and his childhood friends band together to confront an ancient evil that has gripped their hometown of Ludlow in Pet Cemetery Bloodlines. Where do you think we should go? Wherever. Let's just enjoy every second of getting the heck out of Ludlow! The hell is that? First place I learned about death was a pet cemetery. The secret place. Generation to generation, dead things buried in that land would come back. There's something else. Can you hear them? Voices. I think something's wrong with Timmy. He needs time to adjust. The people built the pet cemetery to protect them from evil. It's not Timmy. Something's talking through him. Hell, what have you done? We have to find Timmy. Now stop this. I held him the day he came into this world. And I'm gonna hold him the day he goes out. To quote Judd Randall from the original Pet Cemetery, sometimes dead is better. Well, sometimes dead is better. This time, the movie attempts to tackle an origin story of our Pet Cemetery, the town of Ludlow, and our character Judge Crandall, played in the original 1989 film by one of my personal favorites, Fred Gwynn, then by John Lithgow in 2019. Now, the Pet Cemetery movies was destined to have a prequel attached to it. It has two elements that just screamed prequel. We have an interesting concept that the previous films teased at a mysterious backstory. And of course, we have a single character that just screams likability. And that's the Judd character, even though the 1989 version I'm a bigger fan of. But John Lithgow in the 2019 version did a decent enough job to keep that likability about the character still present. Between these two elements bring a formula, if executed properly can build a great prequel story. 
Pet Cemetery Bloodlines had an opportunity to utilize these two fantastic elements. And with these elements, we have a decent cast here, including David Duchovny and Samantha Mathis. And here comes the butt. But newcomer writers Jeff Bueller from our 2019 Pet Cemetery is back alongside our newcomer director and writer, Lindsay Anders Beer, create a prequel that comes across as it was buried in our Pet Cemetery itself, where it seems lifeless, pale, and roams around the screen, making the viewer want to run far, far away from it. Pet Cemetery Bloodlines is a complete and confusing mess of a movie where we take the simplistic lore and a concept with likable characters and attempt to make it more complicated than it should be and then suck all the likability out of the written characters, then place cardboard performances to attempt to sell the viewer it's something that it's not. This go around, we have Jackson White taking on our young Judd character. And if the movie didn't make it clear enough, I would have thought that this would have been a twist at the end that Judd came straight out of our own Pet Cemetery burial himself. His performance is lifeless, bland, and lazy. The performances make me feel like each cast member maybe saw the first set of films maybe just once, because their portrayal of the characters just seem way off. There's no respect to the original material. But to cut some slack to Jackson White's performance, I'm not saying that White's character Young Judd is written well, because it's not. It's written too safe. It doesn't give us anything really interesting to say about Judd to really make him stand out or relevant or really try to make us go back to the original story and say, oh, that makes sense, that's interesting, but White's performance plays it too safe to the point this is the first time I have seen the Judge character and I just didn't care. He's just kind of placed in a scene and he just goes through the motion of a lifeless story. The only standout performance we have is from Judd's dad, Dan Crandall, played by Henry Thomas, that some might recognize the name from our little young boy who played Elliot in E.T., Thomas at least adds a mysterious portrayal to make his scenes interesting. And as the movie goes on, he is the only character I was actually interested in and actually cared about. Now, by doing a prequel, there is almost a duty or responsibility from the filmmakers to create and treat a prequel as the start of the entire thing. The start of the story, the start of the characters, the start of the conflict to make the story relevant again and either make sense for the viewers that are just being introduced to the rest of the films and even encourage a viewer to go back to the original film and see it in a new perspective for the story. Pet Cemetery Bloodlines checks none of these boxes and treads this story apart from top to bottom where it becomes unrecognizable to the point I forgot it was a Pet Cemetery movie. And even if we boil down just the main concept of a burial that brings people back to life, the filmmakers don't do anything interesting with this concept to make it stand on its own. When the people come back, when the animals come back, there is nothing interesting about what they do. It is underutilized to the point it is just boring. Now, when it comes to our newcomer director, Anderson Beer, the direction here is amateurish, but it's it's just fine. If you take out the character motivation, and then we go into the production value, again, it's just fine, with the exception of the flashbacks. And these flashbacks have the production value of that of a school play. Some of these visuals of the flashbacks with the costume design and the tone is just purely amateurish and laughable. Now, some of these technical aspects are forgivable if the writing is on par. But as I spoke out before with our Judd character, the character writing is off, but not only that, but the writers Beer and Bueller make this simplistic concept confusing, especially those that compare to the previous movies. The writing here reminded me of a politician trying to avoid questions with fluff answers or a student that hasn't studied for the test trying to make his answers long with big words to sound smarter than it is. Throughout the entire movie, this feeling is present with the feeling it was trying to overcomplicate a simplistic concept to the point I had to speak out loud what in the hell is going on multiple times during the film. Then I had to rewind to backtrack to make sense of what Beer and Bueller were trying to do. And about an hour and 15 minutes, I realized I've only watched about 30 minutes in the movie. I've invested an additional hour of rewinds. At this point, I just simply gave up and decided that if I had to rewind this movie this much to ensure I can grasp what Beer and Bueller were trying to land, then shame on me for assuming others will do the same. This movie wasn't worth the time nor the effort if they didn't spend the extra time to really dial in their screenplay and do the diligent research to ensure they can respect the original source material. Pet Cemetery Bloodlines, it's sloppy, it's lazy. It's an utter mess of confusion, horrible writing, and horrible execution. Somebody just needs to bury this damn thing, pour a thousand pounds of concrete, dump it in the Pacific Ocean so nobody can witness this movie ever again. I'm giving Pet Cemetery Bloodlines one star.
A magical meteor crash lands in Adventure City and gives the Paw Patrol pups superpowers, transforming them into the mighty pups in Paw Patrol, the mighty movie. When our world is threatened, one team is ready to launch. <gasps> Did he say launch? Uh, no. I said launch. Uh -huh. The meteor's heading straight for us! <gasps> It's giving off some kind of energy. I didn't do it. No way. This September. I think we've got superpowers. And that's why I wear a hard hat. I have the need for super speed. I'm a wrecking ball. Surf's up. <laughs> Look at your paws. Now the clumsy pup shoots fireballs out of his paws. A new breed of heroes. The power of the real. Hits the big screen. We're gonna need a new name for ourselves. How about the Paw Patrol? But more. With just a little bit extra. Each. How about the Mighty Pup? <laughs> Those should be my superpowers. Coming in hot. I'm gonna take them one by one. <gasps> oh my goodness. I can talk. <laughs> I have so much to say. Give me that. It's so time. Well, well, well. He looks different than I remember. <laughs> All right, puppy, playtime's over. When you go up against one of us, you go up against all of us. Let's go! Now that we're super, I'm never gonna get to sleep. Well, you're probably more tired than you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've got to be kidding me. And yes, this proves that I do see everything with my personal rule about no exceptions. <laughs> no, Paw Patrol the Mighty Movie wasn't made for me. This is a film for kids and Paw Patrol fans. Part of the only joy adults will get from this film is the mere reaction of seeing their kids enjoy their favorite pups on the big screen, which to me is worth the ticket price. And will kids enjoy it? Absolutely. Will parents enjoy the movie just by itself? It doesn't matter. Sit down and be quiet. This movie wasn't made for you. <laughs> now, family movies have tried the last 10 to 20 years to mostly try to cater to both kids and adults through computer animation. Unlike the 90s where we had more of a mix, we had live action family films, then we had animated films that some adults could enjoy but were mostly catered towards kids. There is a little bit of separation to give families something and to have individual movies that were just meant for children. Now, both are extremely important to the film-going experience. To have that set of movies that everyone in the family can enjoy and have some fun with it, no matter how many fart jokes are placed in. And then another set that speak directly to kids to really give them that feeling of the big screen speaking directly to them. To really give those kids a positive message from their favorite characters shine on a big screen and seeing everybody around them with that big audience reaction. I know when I was a kid, there was a lot of films that were just made for us, and they were dominant and they were obvious when they were. But this was before the evolution of online content, smartphones, and other distraction or ways to keep people entertained. And I know when these films came out when I was a kid, I know not all parents at this time were a fan of these movies, but they loved watching the reaction from their kids of finding out they were taking a trip to the movies, then the reaction during the movie, and then the response to the movie after. And that should be the main goal when a movie like Paw Patrol comes out. When you buy a ticket, you're not buying a ticket hoping that the movie is a masterpiece. You're buying a ticket for the child's experience and for you to enjoy their excitement and their reaction along with them. That is the magic of taking your kids at a young age to the movies, is to experience that fun factor to seeing their characters on a big screen with a big experience. Because Paw Patrol The Mighty Movie wasn't made for me, nor was it made for the intent of entertaining adults even though I think some adults out there could really use the messaging of kindness and positivity nowadays, they should take a visit to Paw Patrol. But what parents will enjoy is that Paw Patrol does have an attractive voice cast in which names are familiar. But I didn't see the cast list before the movie, nor did I recognize any of the voices during the runtime. 
So the names didn't really make much of a difference in this movie, but some adults that go into Paw Patrol and know the casting might have something to look forward to on pinpointing the voices in the film. Now, having two kids, I have retired one kid from Paw Patrol, and now I'm in the process of re-watching Paw Patrol. I am very familiar with our overly positive rescue pups, and I am especially interested in their young leader, Ryder, who I'm still hoping for another movie, maybe a prequel explaining where this kid's parents are and what Bruce Wayne wannabe is funding this kid and is talking puppies with all this tech. Maybe even an explanation or an introduction to the side character that modifies these vehicles to accommodate these animal drivers. And I know I'm overthinking this. Like I said, this movie wasn't meant for adults. But what I really did appreciate about Paw Patrol is the fact it practices what it preaches. It doesn't try to be for adults. It pulls all the attention into entertaining kids and portraying a positive message, along with also giving enough shared screen time for each character so the kids can enjoy their favorite pup on screen. The most important thing to transferring a popular children's show on screen is to give kids something bigger, better, that of significance, to have a reason to be on the big screen. And having our Paw Patrol gain superpowers is a fantastic concept of a story to tell on our big screen. Now, parents can be rest assured that Paw Patrol, compared to a lot of animated films now, that cater to both kids and adult with fart jokes, adult jokes that are very subtly hidden inside their movie, Paw Patrol is extremely innocent. But with that comes the challenge of Paw Patrol, that you have to stretch this 20-minute cartoon into an hour and a half movie. And it does struggle a little bit of the time to really have a lot of filler to make that movie and story stretch. With that result, we do get a couple moments of kids becoming restless. But it's short-lived because it does have a lot of good balance between slow filler and action to really gain that kid's attention back into the movie. But overall, it seems like all the kids in the theater were engaged and were having a good time. Again, there are moments of filler where the kids became restless, but it's short-lived. I think the only fault in the story when it comes to a kid's perspective is not giving the villain a little bit more screen time or a little bit more of an origin story. But even take that out, the villains are colorful and they're familiar to the audience. Paw Patrol, the mighty movie, again, is dedicated for our kids and fans of the show. This isn't a movie that we as most adults will seek out, but rather create an early experience with our kids at the movies. And that's what the movies are all about. It creates a great bonding moment with kids and parents and gives them a memorable experience and it opens up a conversation early. Kids will have a lot of fun with this, but for adults, like I said, it doesn't matter because this movie wasn't made for you. It was meant as an experience to experience with your children. It seems like these kids' movies are becoming more rare. When you see a movie that's dedicated just for kids come out in the theater, I encourage you to go take your kids to it so they have something to connect to. For what it is, I'm giving the kids' perspective a Paw Patrol. I'm giving it three stars. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Now, before we get into the rest of the show, make sure you check out my reviews on previous episodes for movies that just became available to rent, buy, or stream now. Now available, Ethan Hunt and his IMF team is back and must track down a dangerous weapon before it falls into the wrong hands in Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, which was a mission accomplished at three stars. An Indian-American teenager has a falling out with her former best friend and inherits a demon that lives in a mason jar, and it lives inside, which had a lot of potential living inside that screenplay, but it barely missed the mark receiving two and a half stars. We have another attempt of telling the story based on the famous Disneyland ride in The Haunted Mansion, which will haunt my dreams and the amount of wasted talent receiving one and a half stars. Justice Knows No Boundaries and The Equalizer 3, which shot its way to three stars. The greatest evil in the Conjuring universe is back in The Nun 2, which made me pray for a better movie, receiving two stars. And finally, he's a superhero whether he likes it or not in Blue Beetle, which was stylish, but the rest of the cast was having more fun than our hero. Blue Beetle bugged me enough to only receive two and a half stars. Make sure you check up on those review, and while you do, don't forget to hit follow or subscribe, and don't forget to leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Now, before we get into the last set of reviews, there is a podcast that I listen to that always brings a smile to my face. It's a podcast I truly look forward to each and every week with a couple of the nicest people in the world and my all-time favorite Wilson family, and that's the Super Familiar with the Wilsons podcast. Make sure you tune in and subscribe to their show, but let's from the Wilsons now. 
the super familiar with the Wilsons podcast. You know that family whose house you hung out in when you were a kid? The house was a little loud and chaotic, but always fun, and sometimes felt more home than home. Well, that's us. We're the Wilsons, and we welcome you into our podcast with silly chat, ridiculous games, and interviews with interesting people. Like a spin doctor. The super familiar with the Wilsons podcast. Welcome home. When two girls disappear into the woods and return three days later with no memory of what happened, the father of one girl seeks out Chris McNeil, who's been forever altered by what happened to her daughter Reagan 50 years ago in a movie that needs a filmmaker's exorcism itself in Exorcist Believer. Don't be scared. We've met before. Are you looking for Reagan? Are you Reagan? What do you think evil is? I'll tell you what I think it is. We're born in this world with hope and dreams and a desire to be happy. Dad? Something's going on with my partner. Wherever those girls went, they brought something back with them. <laughs> to make us lose faith. I believe you can help get our daughters back. To kill it in us. <laughs> and the devil never gives up. She knows who I am. Where's the other girl? <laughs> what you're doing here is dangerous. People have died on both sides of possession. Come on, baby. Come back to us, okay? <laughs> if you don't make it, I don't make it. Mama! What is it, baby? I can't hear you. Baby, I'm right here. I don't want to go to hell. God, play that trick on you. <laughs> there are two heartbeats. Is it working? They're beating in sync. Be strong. Ah! What did you do? One girl lives. One girl dies. You get to choose. Now, let's get this out of the way right from the get go. The original, in a lot of people's eyes, including myself, is a horror masterpiece. But in terms of people seeing the original for the first time today, in this day and age, may not have the same vision, may not have the same feel, and some might not even find it scary. We've had decades of hype, decades of shock factor horror, along with a ton of content online that in some ways have desensitized viewers that watch the original today, and they might not find it scary. The example I like to give when it comes to the evolution of horror is like when I watched The Creature from the Black Lagoon when I was in high school. I absolutely loved that film. But did I find the creature from the Black Lagoon scary? No, absolutely not. But I'm sure others have and maybe still do. How we feel, view, or experience fear isn't a constant mental state that we all share in unison with each other. Every single person has a different state of mind about what we find scary. Even more so, when we look back at these old horror films, these films are a piece of a looking glass into our society's time of how we view horror. All the way up to today, even though our society, we have grown and matured to tolerate some of these old styles of horror, and we may not find them scary. But there are elements of appreciation in the filmmaking process that we can take value from when it comes to these horror movies. And what I actually love to experience is taking a lot of these old horror movies, these universal monsters like Dracula, Frankenstein, Creature from the Black Lagoon. These are the movies I introduce my kids to when it comes to horror movies. These black and white horror films are a great way to introduce kids to horror in a tame way by appreciating the filmmaking process and the effects aren't as realistic to take it seriously in some horror movies or scary elements today. Now, on the topic of time, it's been 50 years since the original Exorcist came out, 
And as I talk about horror films being a looking glass in time when it comes to how we view horror, even though now some people might not find the original scary, what the original did deliver and it still holds up today is a level of unsettlement. And I can really appreciate that. And I think most of us can appreciate what the filmmakers created with the original to give us that feeling of unsettlement that still holds true to that feeling today. And now here comes Exorcist Believer. And in another 50 years in the distant future, people are going to look back and say, what kind of horror garbage did audiences think was good in 2023? And by this time, the original will be 100 years old and it will have a bigger appreciation than the Exorcist Believer will ever have. Now, I already cringe when I see names like Scott Teams and Danny McBride attached to the story writing credits of a horror film. With recent films like Halloween Kills, the Firestarter remake, Insidious Red Door, and now the horrible, horrible Exorcist Believer. These writers have proven one thing with their recent works, is creating a generic movie that will just end up lazy, banking on the mere formula of a nostalgic attack of a franchise that we haven't seen in a while. You add that in with new writer Peter Sadler and a writing credit from our director David Gordon Green, who has had a career that has been all over the place. From directing mostly comedies from Pineapple Express, Your Highness the Sitter, who transitioned more recently into horror, also directing the recent Halloween films. Now, I was well aware of the cast and the filmmakers of Exorcist Believer before going into the movie, but I kept an open mind because I have seen crazier lineups in movies before. But as I was walking out of the movie, I was utterly confused on what the studios and the filmmakers game plan was here. Because if we solely just look at the written material, just the written material by itself, it's not good. It's far from good. And it's lazy. And it's not just lazy. It's beyond lazy. This is the kind of writing that screenwriters go in their own personal hell to listen to. It's like our screenwriters were possessed by soap opera writers from the past that only made it through one episode before getting fired. Exorcist Believer wastes no time to jump right into the main conflict within the first act and ignoring the important little things like, oh, you know, character build, chemistry build, actually any kind of true build to a story. It jumps right into the conflict without anything to really have us care anything about to what happens to the characters. Now, Believer centers itself around two girls, Catherine and Angela, played by Olivia O'Neill and Lydia Duet, who wander off in the woods. Why do you ask? It doesn't matter because the film doesn't really build to any real justified reason why, but it's an easy way for the girls to become possessed and explain the next piece of the story. Now, the girls think they've been gone for three hours, but in reality, it's been three days. Why did it take three days to possess our girls? Or why did our demon not want to keep our girls moving out of the woods once possessed? It doesn't matter because that would take too long for the filmmakers to explain and they would have had to put some thought into it and that would have taken screen time away from some cheap scares that they insert randomly in the film. That makes no sense. Now, once the girls are reunited with their families, they start to show some unexplained symptoms since their disappearance with no medical explanation. Now, during the exploration or the test of our girls, we receive very little examples or exploration to truly believe in possession at this point in the movie. Now, why does a movie spend such little time with the exploration of alternate reasoning for our girls' behavior in the movie? Why do you ask? It doesn't matter, because the filmmakers seem so eager to get to the two main focal points of the film. The introduction to our returning character from the original, Chris McNeil, played by the always lovely Ellen Burstyn. And of course, our exorcism. And we see this eagerness shine from our characters as well. Because each character is giving off a vibe like they're waiting for Christmas morning and they cannot wait to get to our big scene of our exorcism. And as I said in my introduction, the original film is 50 years old and audiences' mindsets are different now compared to then. So it wouldn't be fair to compare the original when it comes to the scare factor. But our director Green, even in terms of current horror, adds absolutely nothing but the generic stuff we see in low-par streaming films. But not only that, he has my biggest pet peeve in horror, which is cranking up the volume with characters that pop out of nowhere for a cheap scare. But Green can't even get this right because the editing is so bad. During these moments, the actual popping out to say boo tactic has a leg to the volume increase, so the timing just comes across as laughable. We get the loud, scary boom, and then wait for it, wait for it. Oh, there's the character that missed his cue that was supposed to come out two seconds ago. 
We see this problem with the editing throughout the film, especially in the beginning where we also have all the other components added to it to really lose credibility on his capability of presenting us with a film that we know won't be as good as the original, but even more so, it doesn't even pass as a passable, scary, entertaining thrill ride. The atrocious editing becomes a distraction in the film, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because I found myself entertained by chuckling during every bad cut. Now, the film was edited by Timothy Alverson, who, surprise, surprise, here also did the horrible Firestarter remake and the other recent Halloween films. I'm starting to see a pattern here, and I'm wondering how long it's going to take for studios to put the puzzle pieces together to not allow this ensemble of filmmakers back to do another horror movie. But I will give The Exorcist a big butt compliment. When it comes to the actual grand finale of The Exorcism, I actually did like this scene. I thought it brought some tension, and without giving anything away, I will just say this. I did like the idea of the characters inside the home. I liked how they brought all these different characters together. And without spoiling it, I'm going to leave it as vague as that. Those of you that see it will put the puzzle pieces together and what I'm referring to. Now, with that scene, here comes the butt. But watching this scene, we are reminded of how much we really desperately needed to know more about these characters and have, at bare minimum, a respectable amount of screen time to really root for this climax. And I love the idea of the climax, but I hated the execution leading up to it. It's like when you're trick-or-treating and the house is about to hand out a king-size candy bar to you, but instead they just slam the door in your face. This scene is wasted by the lazy build. And it reminds the viewer of what a missed opportunity this movie was. When it comes to Exorcist Believer, the only thing that terrified me about this movie is the knowledge of how much money the studio spent to get this movie made. I would have had a much more entertaining ride if they made a movie filming that money being flushed down the toilet and watching director David Gordon Green try desperately to unclog it with a plunger. I'm a firm believer that Exorcist Believer is the worst entry in the Exorcist franchise. I'm giving Exorcist Believer one and a half stars. so hard to keep track and even have time to read all the trending topics on the web. Now there's a new app to help with all of those problems. Newsly is an audio app for iOS and Android. It picks up web articles about the most trending topics on the web at any given moment and reads them to you in a natural human voice. For the first time in the history of the internet, the entire web becomes listenable. Browse articles from topics you choose and start playing. You can follow any topic as specific as you like from sports, science, to Bitcoin. You can even follow Kardashian. It will find you the latest articles and read them to you out loud. And guess what? They have podcasts as well. Explore trending podcasts from over 50 countries. The Movie Wire is now a featured podcast on the Newsly app. Download and use Newsly for free now. The link will be in the description of this episode. You can also use one of my promo codes that you will find in the description as well to get you a one month free premium subscription. Stop scrolling, start listening, download Newsly today. Tom Nichols is a hardened New England detective, unflinching in his pursuit of a case where nothing is as it seems, and it begins to dismantle the illusions in his own life in the Netflix original, Reptile. How have you been feeling? There's a case going on. It's a real nightmare. So what happened? I walked in the front door. I called out for her. Hello? No answer. And then what? <laughs> Can I show you something strange? Ow! That's a bite. It was the dentals that got to Bunny. Is there anyone you can think of who might have done this? A few nights ago, this guy showed up at my house, acting strange. Strange in what way? Who do we like in this? I'll go with the boyfriend. I got the friend. I'll take the weirdo. I'm going with the ex-husband. Am I a suspect? Everyone is a suspect. Are you gonna tell me what's going on? Just call the angel. 
got to think about your future. You can't be a cop forever. Can you keep a secret? I'll tell you a secret. But first, I'm going to need you to do something for me. It's only going to get worse now. No, listen! Get out! Then slowly turn away. Interesting, huh? You know, I was taken back a little bit by Reptile, but not necessarily in a bad way, but actually I was pretty impressed. But in no way am I going to say Reptile is an amazing achievement and a cinematic masterpiece because it's absolutely not. But I'm still impressed, mainly because the minds behind Reptile are music video writer and director Grant Singer, new writer Benjamin Brewer, who is actually a visual effects artist, and we also get a writing credit from our main character detective Benicio Del Toro. This team of writers, along with music video director Grant Singer, actually put together a fairly average but okay entertaining crime mystery with a fantastic cast. Now again, Reptile stars Benicio Del Toro as Detective Tom Nichols, who is investigating the murder of real estate agent's wife, Will Grady, played by Justin Timberlake. This seemingly cut and dry murder seems solved until it opens up a rabbit hole of a lot more than Detective Nichols would have ever imagined. Now, first off, what I can appreciate about Reptile is that the writers are not going beyond what they know. They know their boundaries, and at times this could be a fault, because they do present an artificial script. They spend most of the runtime over-explaining and attempting to convince or sell to the viewer that they are more clever than the audience. And there is a certain respect that the writers do stay within their boundaries of what they know, but then they go into unknown territory where they try and sell us stuff that we're just not buying, like we're at a timeshare presentation. Now, for the first half of the movie, the script stays simplistic. The mystery, even with the tremendous amount of holes, it stays simplistic but engaging, with a lingering feeling based on what the writers present to us that everybody on screen is a suspect. Whether this was intentional or not, it doesn't really matter because a lot of what Reptile does with the element of simplicity and Del Toro's character, it all works here, at least for an engaging streaming experience. Del Toro knows how to work the room when it comes to being a subtle powerhouse on screen. He completely milks that here and takes advantage of our new film director, which demands for all eyes on him. And that's not a bad thing because most of the movie I was actually enjoying his performance. And not just his, along with most of the other performances, with a few exceptions. And that exception being Justin Timberlake, who again plays our real estate agent Will Grady, who most of the time wanders the screen like he's lost or he just got punished by his parents. This is a mix between a poorly written character and Timberlake not knowing what to do with the written material. Also not knowing what to do when there is not a lot of speaking parts. Even though I did respect the simplistic nature of the screenplay in Reptile, there is quite a bit of flaws more prominent when it comes to the discovery of Del Toro's character, where the film attempts to give depth to Del Toro's persona, but it never really lands because our writers really show their flaws when it comes to the character development. When we start to see the film attempt to show scenes of depth to our detective, it just seems to go nowhere as it's used for filler. It doesn't progress the story, nor does it the character. We get an overlaying abundance of confidence from the writers, but in the character development, it's severely lacking. During the second half, we get a complete character change from the Nichols character like we just flipped a light switch, and it doesn't really make sense. We have no justification on why the sudden change that actually is believable or makes sense. But where we really start to feel the story start to stretch is during the second half where we really start to feel the film really stretch to make something of itself that it's really not. During the second half is where our filmmakers get way too overly confident in their own characters to continue this story. That should have really been a 90 minute movie because most of the interesting things that happen is during the first half of the film. We can really feel the movie start to push itself and stretch itself past its limits where it does overstay its welcome. The movie reminded me of somebody that's trying to tell a lie, but you're believing him, but is talking way too much to the point we go from trusting to disbelief. Reptile oversells its story, even though I was being sold on the simplicity of it all. And when we get to the climax is where we really feel the rush of the movie trying to plug all the plot holes. But by this point, there are way too many holes to cover in the little time the film has left without stretching itself into another additional 30 minutes. With the rush of the climax and limited character conflict resolved, by the time the credits rolled, I went from feeling like this movie had a good thing going, then to complete emptiness. 
Reptile had all the makings of being a good straight-to-streaming film. It had me sucked in within the first 15 minutes. I was really having a good time with it. But by the time I reached the midway point, I could feel the film really stretching itself into uninteresting territory. Reptile, for what it's worth, given the limited writing and directing experience from the filmmakers, if you put that in perspective, it isn't that bad. But the lack of experience doesn't justify a good review because the film is far from perfect. It lacks proper character development pacing, and I felt like it was two different movies by the end of the roll time. But in fairness, it is one of the most simplistic murder mysteries that won't require a lot of your attention to figure out while watching. I'm giving Reptile two stars. And that's a cut on this week's edition of The Movie Wire. I want to thank you for listening and thank you for your support. You can also show support by following me on Instagram, TikTok, Blue Sky, X, Thread, Facebook, and Letterbox at Movie Wire Show. And please don't forget to leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Do it right after this show. Until next week, do me a favor. Make sure you stay for after the credits to show the respect to those that put their blood, sweat, and tears into making a feature film. And support your local movie theaters. A verdict has been made on this episode of The Movie Wire by your host, Justin Hansen. He thanks you for listening to the show. You can follow Justin on Instagram and Twitter at Movie Wire Show or visit his website, www.themoviewire.com. Oh, and don't forget to leave a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Until next time, we will see you at the movies. Thank you for bringing me to the movies.